the first couple of times you go on your bicycle, it hurts, right? It's not that comfortable. You have to sort of get into it. So, yeah, look, I do have sympathy for people who are not that familiar with it, you know, for whom, you know, Zoom is such a problem. But, you know, my advice is go for it. Uh, there's a lot that you can get from it. And one good thing is that, you know, people a lot younger, you know, than me, uh, they usually have no problem at all. I mean, they're, they're born online. So, you know, my, my son has two kids. I mean, he and his wife are just like totally fine. And I'll, I'll give you, by the way, an interesting, uh, example, uh, just two examples regarding family life and how the online connection helps. Uh, today, this very day is, uh, is one of our grandson's fourth birthday. He's four years old today. Congratulations. So, <laughs> thank you. So we all uh, got together on Zoom, you know, a few hours ago and sang him happy birthday. And he, he didn't like that. He was embarrassed, but still it was fun. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then on Wednesday, um, that's the first uh, night of the Seder uh, in, in Jewish religion. And what this usually involves is like the whole family comes in from all over the place. And it's actually not that healthy for you because you, you eat too much food, you, know, you drink too much wine, you sit around a table. <laughs> so, but we're not doing that, you know, because it, it, it doesn't make sense for everybody to get together like this. So the, uh, it's actually, uh, uh, the father of my, my in-laws of, of my son's wife, he is actually making the Seder. There's no food involved. We're just going to get together for an hour through Zoom and basically go through all these, uh, frankly, you know, the, the, the rituals are nonsense, but they're fun anyway, because you've know, been doing it since you're a little kid. So I, those are examples of where a family can still be together, e even though, we can't be physically together and that's all because of digital media you know you know if you think about uh other flus and epidemics i mean i mean obviously it, it goes back to the middle ages and before you know the black plague the bubonic plague the misnamed spanish flu because it probably began in kansas those poor people for them it was either don't talk or see anybody or die so i mean they didn't have this option, and it's good that we do. I've been thinking for a while that there have been three ages and revolutions in television, right? First, there was television itself. It came around in the 1950s. This is traditional network television. Then, beginning maybe in the late 1990s, early 21st century, like with The Sopranos on HBO, suddenly cable television became extremely important. And there were some very significant differences between cable and network. Uh, it didn't matter if you missed the show because they showed it more than once. They usually had continuing serial stories rather than each individual episodes. But then, you know, a few years ago, so we're talking about, you know, 2013, 2014, Netflix and House of Cards, and then Amazon Prime comes in, you know, with the man in the high castle and shows like that. Uh, and, and yes, I think this, this third wave of television, streaming, is, is the, now the cutting edge of television. And I think they are really thriving because people need more content uh, in, in this age of the coronavirus. And I, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's a good thing. Because again, you know, over the years, there have been people who've said, and this goes back again, even like to the 1950s and in the decades immediately after, if you watch too much television, it's no good for you. <laughs> and there was a book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. I don't know if it's fair, <laughs> like, the point of is, written by a guy whose name, believe it or not, was Jerry Mander, which here in the United States, to Jerry Mander, something means to you know, uh, mess around with it. So the guy had a crazy name. And anyway, he had four arguments about why television should be eliminated. His, <laughs> his main argument was, if you watch too much television, you'll suffer a kind of brain damage. <laughs> so I remember I reviewed the book, and I, I basically, in a nicer way, said, this is a really stupid book, and here's why I think it's stupid. And you tell me, 
you know, read this review. Does it seem to you that I'm suffering from brain damage? So the review was published. And I got like a nasty letter from Jerry Mann saying, you don't have to be so snarky. I'm just <laughs> trying to make, but, you know, so I have no concerns at all. If people are watching more television now, fine. Wh whatever they need to do to relax. And, 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 and that's a lot better than going out to a bar or going out to a restaurant where God knows, you know, what you might pick up. No, I don't, I don't think that's a problem at all. And one of the things, by the way, a lot of people don't know this. I mean, if you don't watch Netflix, but there are an enormous amount of series, an enormous amount of content on Netflix that's not in English. I mean, I've seen, there's, in fact, there's like a whole new uh, genre called Nordic Noir. And basically what it is, it's, you know, they're literally like detective shows and murder shows and police dramas and so on that are made in, you know, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Iceland, Denmark, uh, and, and they're done in those languages. And I don't speak those languages, so, but, but I'm beginning to slowly learn the languages because there are English subtitles. But that's also true of Europe. Uh, there, there's a, a detective show. I like detective shows that are, you know, in general, that was made in Belgium, uh, a very good show. Uh, I, I've seen shows in, in Russian. Uh, there's a very good Spanish time travel series. <laughs> uh, so we, and I love time travel as a science fiction writer. So on the one hand, yes, it's true that Netflix is sort of eating up the lunch of all the more local operations. But what it's also doing is it's giving the world... And, and especially Americans who tend to just think and do everything in English. But it's giving us, you know, these windows into other languages and other cultures, which, which I think is, uh, is, is wonderful. I mean, there was a great series. I can't remember the names of any of them. It was like a four-section series that takes place in Cuba, of all places, and that was done also in Spanish, and, and it was really great, you know. You, and we are one of the things about Netflix also is because everything with them from the beginning has been digital, it is incredibly clear cinematography, so you see beautiful yes. imagery as well. The key difference is, as you know, w when you broadcast something, the broadcast can only go a limited distance, right? And then basically you can't hear or see it anymore. Cable was an improvement, but even cable had to go through cables, right? So, but as soon as you get into the digital realm, then wow, you know, you, you can uh, get the movie from here to Beijing instantly. So assuming the Chinese government allows it, that's another story. <laughs> but uh, the technology is, is fabulous, and, and it is truly the realization of McLuhan's Global Village. Yeah. The internet, as far as news is concerned, and as far as information is concerned, is distinct from entertainment, which I think is only good as far as entertainment is concerned. But if we're talking about news and truth, uh, the internet is a two-edged sword. Because on the one hand, it's never been easier for people to just lie. And I'm sorry to say, we see that every day with our American president. Donald Trump, he just makes stuff up. He exaggerates things. He gets things wrong. I, I mean, it's a, I, if he were a student in my class, he'd get an F. <laughs> it's a panic. It, just yesterday, he's talking about, you know, the, the, you know, there's like an antibiotic, erythromycin, I think it is, that might be helpful uh, in treating coronavirus victims. And then there's a, something hydrochloride, which could be helpful. Two very different things. And and, but one of the problems with the hydrochloride is it's a very powerful medication. It's used to treat malaria uh, and I think lupus. And, but it's such a powerful medication, doctors are very careful in prescribing it. It can weaken your heart, do things like that. Trump, the genius, is up there talking. And he's basically saying, so we have to be careful with erythromycin. So, I mean, he wasn't even deliberately lying. He, can't, he just can't distinguish truth from falsity. And somehow he, he's president. That's, you know, <laughs> a, really, a really tragic indictment of democracy. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, as I also said in that talk that, that you uh, watched, at the same time, 
the internet provides us with unprecedented means of checking, you know, anything we come across. So if somebody were watching yesterday, uh, Trump's daily press conference in which he's jabbering away about the hydrochlorate, uh, you know, I'm sorry about the erythromycin being good for you. You should take it. That's possible. And they weren't at all sure about that. All they had to do was go online, search on that, and they'll instantly find a hundred different sources. So that's why I always tell my students and anyone who's interested, you need to get in the habit of checking anything that you're even slightly doubtful about. You need to be suspicious of everything and anything. And frankly, anytime I see anything online, that, that I'm at all suspicious of, I just check it before I say anything. So, uh, and fortunately, we now have the availability to do that. You know, one, and that's an advantage of our day and age. You know, when somebody in the president's office lied to the American people, I'll just give you one of many examples. Lyndon Johnson, who became president after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. He, yeah. he, he lied to the American people. He said, basically, the North Vietnamese attacked us in the Gulf of Tonkin, and therefore, we're going to send in all these American troops. What actually happened was we deliberately provoked the North Vietnamese to attack us. We sailed in and out of their waters. It was a very cleverly designed plan. But back then, in the mid-60s, I mean, and I, I was a kid then, I was a student, but I opposed the war. I knew that there was something wrong with it, but I had no way of getting the information because what did I know? Only what was in newspapers and on network television. But yeah. now, anytime anybody's suspicious, you can easily check. It's a very dangerous path. But again, you have to question it if, if it doesn't ring true to you. So if I see a video in which... Uh, it's Barack Obama saying, I just want to tell the American people in the world that Donald Trump is one of the best presidents ever in the United States. I know that, that that's impossible. Or, uh, you know, let's say somebody sends my wife a picture of me with like an absolutely gorgeous young woman <laughs> on my arm. <laughs> that, it's true. No, that, that, you know, I would tell my wife, hey, sweetie, listen, you know, you know, check it out. I wasn't in that place at all. So, uh, you know, but as, as, I, as I did point out in the talk, it, 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 we all should be concerned about these deep fakes because the problem is physiologically, when we see something, we tend to believe it in a way which is different from when we read something. So if we read a story online, I think most people unconsciously know that they are reading a secondhand description. They know that they're reading what somebody else saw and then they're relaying it to you. So there's a certain amount of inherent skepticism in, in the reading process. But the problem is that a video, as we both know, uh, it, it seems like a first-hand situation. And if it's done cleverly enough, it seems convincing. But I think, again, the same remedy applies. If there's anything that doesn't ring true, uh, you, you should check it out. But, of course, what this does say is if it's a fake video about something that people don't already know a lot about, then there is the danger that you could be taken uh, in for it, so into it. Uh, you, so you have to look at each situation. You know, I'm sure in terms of the coronavirus pandemic that we're going to see fake videos of medical authorities who we don't know saying that we should do stupid, wrong things. So it'll seem real to us. But if what the person is suggesting, even though they're wearing a white outfit and they look like they're a doctor, doesn't feel completely right to us. We should just check that out. That's still a good remedy that we have for that. I almost feel bad for Abraham Lincoln because the more you learn about him, you know, he's a great American president. He freed the slaves. He was brave. He was powerful. As I think I may point out in the video, you know, First of all, there's that ridiculous photograph where they basically took, you know, the image of the Southern senator who's you know, sitting there, looks great standing there, and they basically lop off his head and put it on Lincoln's head. 
But then, like almost 100 years later, they make a movie about Lincoln, who in reality had this like high pitched squeaky voice. I mean, he probably, probably he was, he's probably sound like four score and seven years ago. <laughs> the Gettysburg Address, but they get Henry Fonda and he goes, four score and seven years ago. <laughs> so, uh, everything that we know about Lincoln, uh, you know, through the media in one way or another has been distorted. Um, by the way, one point I didn't mention, and you know, this is like a, a sort of another version of fake news, and it's an in interesting thing to consider. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to, to stay on the subject of American presidents, he was the only president who was elected four times in office. Uh, people in the United States loved him. He helped get us out of the Great Depression. He was our president in World War II. You know, he supported England. He put together the alliance. And, but all that people saw of him then uh, was him standing and giving speeches. And of course, they heard his voice on the radio. A lot of people didn't know that he was paralyzed from the waist down. He had suffered polio when he was, you know, a younger man. And, you know, not that it would have mattered. I mean, people are so worried back then. He probably still would have been a beloved president, but he wanted to project this image of strength and power. And so, he made sure that whenever he was giving an address that was filmed, it was before television, he was already behind the, uh, you know, the podium before the camera started rolling. So th this happens all the time. Um, you, you know, uh, people in the public eye try to make themselves look as good as possible, and uh, you know, especially in politics. Except again, Donald Trump. He looked and sounds like an idiot, and, and yet he somehow became president. <laughs> you know, Europe has really a much better system of democracy than we have here in the United States. Yeah. Our system, it was created way, way back at the end of the 1700s, and they put in place this electoral college, which yeah. was basically just as like an anti-democratic and anti-people component because you know hillary clinton won the popular vote right she should be president but because they count the votes in each state and award them each a number of electors it's a and, it, and it's happened more than once in american history yes. Yes. Person like the president didn't even win the popular vote someday uh we'll change that here in the, in the united states but th these kinds of changes always take a long time to happen necessity is the mother of invention and it's the only way education can continue and you know here's an important thing that a lot of people don't realize first of all i mean it's not that hard to do what we're doing zoom and conduct a class this way synchronously but it's even easier to conduct the class asynchronously and in fact that's what i decided to do at fordham because it happened so quickly i just wanted to make it as easy as possible for the students and so the way i conduct my two classes at fordham is uh the, the class has already required students to make verbal presentations to the class and send me written reports so i told the students look uh, for your verbal presentation just pick up your phone you know, record your, you know, presentation, upload it to YouTube, send it to me, and I'll send it out to the class. And then we can ask questions, and you can answer the questions. And everybody got that, and they didn't have, even have to know how to use Zoom or even their, their laptops, you know. And one of the good things about the digital revolution is that just about everyone in the world now uh, has a, a smartphone. And, and you can do amazing things with those smartphones. And you can easily, it's never been easier than it is now to record a video. <clears throat> and you can easily upload it to YouTube. And then you can just you know, put that link into an email and there you go. And you know if it's done asynchronously, you don't have to worry about everyone being around at the same time. So that's what I would advise any uh, you know, professor, uh, or a teacher who's looking to get a class going online, just start asynchronously, work through the phones. You don't need any fancy uh, apps or software. Well, let me tell you, I mean, first of all, they're different things. Cambridge Analytica is, is really in a class by itself, and it's a bad class because what Cambridge Analytica did, as you know, worked out a deal with Facebook 
where they were able to get the preferences, what people liked, what they commented upon, and then sold that private information to uh, the conservative, uh, you know, Brexit people in England and the Trump people here in the United States with very bad consequences. So uh, that's, I think, not going to happen again all that quickly. I think Facebook has been put on notice. They can't sell private information like that. If, you know, obviously they charge money for ads, that's fine. But to sell private information about their users, if they keep doing that, as big as they are, they'll wind up going out of business, and I think they recognize the problem. But I, I think Facebook and, and Cambridge Analytica, that relationship is an exception to what a lot of people are concerned about uh, re regarding these big companies. And let, let me tell you, way back in the 1990s, there was a time when Microsoft, you know, owned by Bill Gates, they were just running everything. Yeah, they yeah. had knocked, you know, Apple out of first place. That you know, everything was Microsoft Windows. Everybody was using Windows. People were saying, "Oh, you know, Apple is finished." Uh, people were saying here in the United States, we have to put anti-monopoly laws and restrictions on Microsoft. I wrote an article published in the Industry Standard called "Leave Poor Microsoft Alone." <laughs> And the, basic, the article basically said, we don't need the government to limit Microsoft because you know what? The natural evolution of media and the natural competition that that evolution brings, they'll put Microsoft in its proper place. And not that Steve Jobs read you know, my article, but almost the day after it was published, obviously he couldn't have read it because he'd been working on this for a while, Apple announced a whole new series of products. And within five or six years, Apple had overturned Microsoft as, as the big uh, you know, company. And you and I were just talking about networks. Once upon a time, uh, the, the big networks here in the United States, there were three of them, CBS, NBC, ABC. Now, in addition to those three networks, you yeah. have HBO. Uh, Showtime is owned by CBS, so they're technically the same network. But Netflix is, a, is, is not uh, owned uh, by anyone. Uh, Disney now bought out. I think Disney and CBS are connected. But yeah. the point is there's actually been a growth because of technology in, in the number of outlets. Apple TV is, uh, and I'm very happy about Apple TV for a couple reasons. One, they're developing a television series production of Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Yeah, <laughs> which is my best uh, science fiction I, I ever read. Um, and not only that, I'm, I'm doubly happy because they also brought back Steven Spielberg's amazing stories. And I've actually had a whole bunch of stories published in Amazing Stories, the physical magazine. So I'm living here in hope that maybe they'll, put, they'll make one of my stories into, hey, hey Steven Spielberg, if you're watching, <laughs> take one of my stories. But, um, so, but, but, but Apple isn't owned by anybody either. So if you actually count up all the number of communication companies and you put Google in there and you put Twitter in there and you put Facebook in there, plus the three networks, plus Netflix it's, oh, and Amazon, Amazon Prime, you actually probably have about 15 or more major communication companies uh, in, in contrast to what you had uh, in the 1960s with just three television stations. You yeah. still have the New York Times, they're independent. So um, I, that's why I'm, I'm not too concerned about 